August, August 12, 2020. Uh, first item minutes, meeting minutes of our last two meetings of July 29th and August 5th, 2020. I had one comment on the, the July 29th meeting. At the very end, we talked about the water department, water restrictions. Uh, there was a statement that there's no problem with water with water ban. I think you, we need to correct that statement to say something like, we're still concerned about conserving water, even though there's no, I don't know what do you call it, water ban or something. It, gives a mixed message the way it's stated. You know, we have a ban, but, or we don't have a ban, but we've got signs up all over saying there is a ban, so. Yeah, I'm, I, I understand what you're trying to get at. Um, Would it address that concern to change it from, there is no need currently for a stricter water ban than we are already having? Because the one we have is not that strict. You can. You know, every other day you can right. do things like lawns and cars. Right. Okay. So, yeah, for, for a stricter outdoor watering ban. How about that? Okay, that sounds fine. Okay, any other discussion on the minutes? Motion, I make a motion to approve minutes of July 29th and August 5th. I second that. Okay, roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Fred? Yes. <coughs> okay, moving on. Uh, vendor and payroll warrants. Any comments on that? They were signed and everybody looked at them, supposedly. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Public comment. Uh, anybody want to make comments on items that are not listed on our agenda for this evening? Fred, I received one request. Okay. From uh, Dan Dennehy, it reads, I suggest working out all the details for the purchase and installation of a generator from the town for the town office building this summer, so a warrant to fund can be put on a fall town meeting if monies are available. This should allow installation before winter. Thanks, Dan Dennehy. Okay. I think that was one of our uh, capital improvement projects that we voted on. It was one that was deferred, right? The one that was deferred, right. Yeah. yeah. And Keith is, uh, I've seen emails recently between Keith and, and Mark Boussier. We're still trying to figure out the the issues, whether natural gas would be available or not. So that is, he's continuing to do some research on that. Okay, so we're working on that and, and we'll be addressing that in the near future. Yep. Yeah. Okay, anything else on the public comment? No. Okay, moving on. Uh, next item is schedule appointments. And uh, we're on, on time here at the Center School Visioning Committee. I think Mary Stewart is gonna make the presentation about what we've, uh, what we've been hearing. And the way I like to do this is, uh, I guess Mary to make her presentation and then I guess I would ask other members of the committee that are that are on the Zoom if they have some additional comments that they want to make. And then we'll turn it over to the, the select board if we have comments, questions, and on on the presentation on, on their report. And then after that, I guess I'd like to talk about where do we go from here? What's our next steps? And I have a proposal to make. Uh, that, that I've been trying to discuss with the board for the last meeting or two, and we wanted to hear your presentation first. Uh, then I'll, I'll make a proposal how we should proceed, and then we can talk about that uh, as a board, and, and your input would be welcome on that as well. So right now, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Mary. Okay, so I'm going to do sharing screen. Is that what I'm doing, Mary? Yeah, you should be able to. Okay. 
Uh-oh. Is it allowing you to? Uh, it's not super happy. Let me try again. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, can you all see that? I can see it. Okay, great. Okay, great. So, um, uh, um, we're going to organize this so I'm running the slides, but I'm not the only person presenting. So just a heads up. So as you know, this is the report from our group that has spoken about this, the vacant school building and what could happen with it. Um, so we, there's quite a bit of action that took place over the, hard to remember. Um, back in November, we toured the site. We had a total of seven meetings. Um, we looked at a variety of options and reviewed um, some of the history that was related to the site. We did an assessment of the current state and what was needed in order to get it up to speed in terms of whether it's going to be sold or whatever the options are. Uh, we surveyed residents that, that took place at, the, um, at a variety of locations, including the transfer station. Uh, we did some research on zoning and parking regulations, um, and we generated a list of grant opportunities for financial incentives that could be used in this um, for this building, and then some some really basic estimates of costs depending on what um, what kinds of options. Um, so most of you know this history. The it was it's an old. Uh, Georgian style building. Um, there are two classrooms on the first floor. It was used for elementary age children. We had a number of people who were at the visit who had gone to the school. Um, it was initially a coal furnace, but um, there was no plumbing and electrical initially. Then it was converted to oil. Um, in, in 1991, the town transferred the children to the new ele elementary school, and it was used variably since then, but it's been vacant since 2018. Um, we, uh, we located a map of the site just so that people can have a sense, and if you, um, you can see number 17 there is the building, and then there's a little circle is the, is the um, um, milk bottle, and um, you notice that um, the house behind, which is um, Anne's house, is very close to the line of the um, property. So we learned that um, all mechanical systems would need to be replaced. Uh, the septic as well likely needs to be replaced. The roof um, there needs to be some sort of assessment because it's not, it's not clear about whether that needs to be replaced or just repaired. Um, there's clear need for additional installation. There's significant masonry repairs that need to be done. Um, and then, of course, testing and abatement for lead and asbestos as needed. And then there's issues around ADA compliance, given the age of the building and how it's constructed. Um, and it costs the town about $4,400 a year to own the building. Um, so there aren't any um, utility costs, but there are sort of maintenance costs and other kinds of costs that are associated with this building for the town. So Marissa is going to talk next about uh, some of the resident responses when we get our survey. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Um, so hi, I'm Marissa. Um, I'm going to be talking about the survey of residents that we conducted. Um, kind of to get a sense of how residents could see the space being used. So this was sort of aside from all of the things that Mary just talked about, about where the building currently stands and costs and what things need to be done. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm just going to summarize what we did and the results and direct you to the full report, which I think you all received a copy of and 
think is also posted on the town website. And that goes into more detail about the survey administration and it has a copy of the survey instruments as well. So we surveyed 149 residents, which is about 10% of the total population of Waitley, and respondents equally represented Waitley Center, East Waitley, and West Waitley in terms of where they lived. The survey was broken into three main sections. The first one was an open-ended question that asked respondents to list three things that they thought were missing and they would like to see in the center of town. And this was before we introduced the center school specifically. So we're really trying to get a sense of sort of unprompted responses of things that people would like to see in the center of town and things that they might not necessarily envision the center school space being used for. The next main section of the survey was a, another open-ended question that asked respondents to list three uses for the center school building. So this was specifically after we introduced the building and said, you know, how could you see this building being reused? And then we kind of compared the responses between this question and the other open-ended question to see if there were any differences between things that people would like to see in the center of town versus things that they could see that they could envision the space being used for. And then the last main part of the survey was a closed-ended question where we provided respondents with a list of options, potential uses for the building, and asked them to choose their top three. Um, so this was a way where we could easily aggregate responses across um, surveys and also kind of force respondents to pick their favorite options based on a list that the committee had kind of already given a preliminary evaluation of. We specifically didn't include any cost estimates in this survey because we were really trying to get a sense of pure opinions of uses without factoring in any biases based on opinions of town budgets or funding or anything like that. Um, so again, this was sort of a preliminary survey of general ideas that residents had, not necessarily asking residents to react to specific options, which could potentially be another survey in the future perhaps after getting some specific proposals for the spaces. Um, so in terms of the results, I'm gonna go in reverse order. So starting with the close-ended question, you can see the responses up on the screen in this chart. So as you can see, almost half of respondents liked the idea of using the space as a cafe or restaurant. And about one third of respondents liked each of the following uses, which were maker or art craft spaces a community center for town use, multiple private residences, and a public park for town use. In terms of the open-ended responses, um, almost half of respondents thought that the um, community spaces were something that was missing from the center of town and also envisioned the center school being used as a community space. So specific mentions included parks, playgrounds, public meeting spaces, community centers, and other responses, which you can see in the full report. Um, about half of respondents also wanted to see more eateries, restaurant type things, and other stores in the center of town, but did not as often mention those as ways to use the center school. Given that a cafe or restaurant was the most popular option on the close-ended list, we think that this wasn't because respondents didn't want the center school used that way, but more that they could not envision it being used that way just yet. Um, respondents occasionally mentioned target users that they envisioned using this repurposed space and most commonly mentioned seniors, low income residents and children. Um, respondents did not often specify future ownership. So this implies that they were really more concerned about the use of the space and less concerned about whose hands the building or the lot stayed in. Um, and again, I will direct you to the full report because that has a lot more detail on specific responses that residents gave and distributions of responses for each survey item. And we'll pass it off to Judy to talk about grant options. Hi, Mary, can we have the next slide? Yep, sure. This, this uh, talks about various financial options. I think it, we all learned with Town Hall that we don't necessarily have to rely just on town money or um, owner money to, to invest in a property. And what we tried to do here was show a range of grants along with some of the uses we identified. And the uses vary by 
by owner type, as well as by tax status. A um, couple things to clarify. When we're talking about, and, and you can see the grants listed in more detail in the report and the uses described in the report. They're on pages eight and nine. When we're talking about municipal with a long lease, we envision that the tenant would be responsible for the renovation cost, not the town. Um, when we're talking demolition here, we're not, we're talking about demolition for a park. Um, we had ruled out an option of someone buying the property tearing the building down and building a new building because of the zoning, uh, which seems overly restrictive unless the building is actually there and, and preserved. So you can see a range of grant availability. The, the more generous ones, which are available to municipalities only. So that would be the first two the ones that are generally available across all categories are the CPA ones, um, although the affordable housing could only obviously be used for housing. Uh, I guess I should say the more generally available ones are the historic preservation ones. Um, and the state and federal tax credits are obviously only available to some of you paying taxes. So. And then I, the next slide. Each of these options has different constraints in terms of regulatory, regulatory requirements, as well as um, the financial availability. I think it's important to note that if you use the current, the zoning, the, under our current zoning, um, a special permit would be required for almost every use. And that means that the ZBA would opine on the, the appropriateness of the use for the site. And also site plan review would be required. That means that the planning board would look to make sure that the, the proposed use is safe, well lit, drained properly, et cetera. Whether the municipal bid laws apply or not obviously depends on who's doing the work. And I wanted to talk a little bit about ADA compliance because under most cases it would be required. But because this building is a contributing building in the National Register District, it is possible that some potential waiver of ADA compliance could be achieved. Um, I've seen buildings, situations where buildings had one floor accessible and not the other, for instance. So, so when we think about ADA compliance, it may be slightly different than what we're used to. And uh, that's it for me. I think Leslie is next. You ready, Leslie? We don't hear you yet. I can hear you now. Oh, I was having a dog emergency. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, um, um, there's always a chance my dogs are going to explode. So that'll be very loud. My apologies in advance. So we looked at several of the different options that were available to the town. And the first one, obviously, is demolition. And I think that to people to whom it seems like that would be the you know, cost-free way to do things, it was very surprising to learn that, in fact, it would cost between sixty to one hundred thousand dollars to um, demolish the school, and that there would be no financial support available. So it's not a completely cost-free option. Um, one option is to sell to a private owner. That limits the grants that Judy was speaking about, um, but it could provide tax revenue. And, it and and the flip side of that also is that we lose the control of the historic building in the center of town when we do that. We considered continuing to have the town own and use the building, not understanding exactly what the renovation cost for that would be because we don't really understand 
you know, how to use the building. And there did not, you know, in conversations we were having with different people, could not identify current need for that building. There's a possibility of the town continuing to own the building and having a private lessee, um, you know, that still presents some grants. It would be really difficult to understand what the, again, what the renovation costs would be because we don't know what, how the building would be used. And again, it's still unclear if the town needs the space to do that. And another option would be that the town continues to own the building, but leases it to a private entity. Again, who knows what the renovation costs, there are grants available, and this turns out to be the recommendation of the committee, and we can dive into that a little bit more. We want to go to the next slide. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question before you go on? I don't think I understand the difference between the last two. One is where the town continues to own the building. Help me understand this, guys. But the town also <laughs> becomes a user of the building, maybe relying on a private entity to share the building with us, for instance. So oh. we might keep some offices or some community space, oh. but maybe a, a private entity runs the cafe and we have the meeting space or something of that nature. My, oh, okay. that, thank, people, thank you. That, that example actually helps a lot. Okay, Thanks. thank you. So on to the next slide. So here's why we chose this sort of idea of the private, the town owning the building and continuing to have a long-term lease. The pros of that would be that the tenant is then Per the entity responsible for the renovation costs, which lifts that off of the town, provides less administrative burden for the town, so the town's then not responsible for the snow plowing and the weed whacking and the, when the boiler takes a dive. There are better prospects for sustained tax revenue, which I think the town should be interested in. There's a possibility of lower rehab costs by avoiding municipal bid laws. We talked at length about um, the expenses that the town would face in rehabbing the building versus a private entity and the possibility for historic tax credits for the town, which that's not something I can speak to, but Judy could probably speak to. I think it's more the possibility of historic tax credits for the tenant. tenant. So, okay. My apologies. Um, so the cons to that would be that now the town loses the use of that building if they, we should somehow determine that we need it for the term of the lease. Um, we wouldn't be able to combine municipal or private use as easily. That doesn't rule it out, but it means that maybe we become the tenant of the tenant of us in a weird way. Um, but it does limit our ability to, to use it. And it gives us less control over various aspects of the building, although I do think that there are some remedies to that as we put, out a, put it out to bid. Uh, next slide. So a short-term lease versus a long-term lease. So a short-term lease gives us more control over the building and its maintenance, makes it avail available for future town use. If for some reason we decide, you know, what this town really needs is its own senior center, just an example. Um, we were in a short-term lease, it's up in a couple of years. Now we've got access to that. Um, it allows ease, more easily for a combination of municipal and private uses. It provides income to offset the rehabilitation costs. It provides the possibility of tax revenue based on this, its usage, and it maintains its eligibility for the Green Communities Grant, which does not require a match. On the other hand, it, the administrative responsibilities for the town um, come larger, and the cost of outsourcing building management would be an, an alternative to that. Um, the municipal bid law would increase the renovation costs and the risk of vacancy could reduce rental income and be a burden on the town. Um, next slide. So I think this is the last slide, right? Um, so this was the committee's recommendation pre-pandemic <laughs> was that um, if we put this out to bid, that we, re we recommend that we include in the RFP that we require that the town maintains ownership of the building, that whoever renovates it maintains its historical nature, and that they adhere to specific timelines. And that we would give preference to projects that are usable by a variety of residents, that uses green construction, that 
offers to fund most of the renovation rather than putting that as a burden on the town that respects and um, there are two pretty close abutting neighbors that it respects those property owners and that it is something that would draw people to the center of town. Is that the last slide, Mary? I think that's the last slide. All right. This is the last slide. This is the last slide. Thank you to the committee. <laughs> <laughs> it seems so long ago, I gotta say. It seems so long ago. Okay, and I think we've got several of these committee people online on, on a Zoom meeting. Uh, do any of them want to uh, say anything else that was not covered in the presentation? No? Okay. okay. Uh, as Mary, you can, can you unshare? I can. Well, as as you as you can see, I was one of the members of, of the committee. Uh, we had a few other people come in, come and go on the committee. Uh, committee was organized by the select board back in I don't know in October, November, sometime, and we tried to get people with various skill sets that would uh, help us during the evaluation and recommendation period. Uh, we didn't get everybody that we wished to, to get to be on the, on the committee. Uh, I guess I think that the committee did a, did a very good job. We spent a lot of time on the survey. We was a lot of people individually went out to get uh, responses to the, to the surveys. I think some of it you saw in the Waitley Scoop article as as well as is online the the costs mentioned in in this presentation and and others that we got after i guess after the survey were based on costs from from really professional people it wasn't just an off the cuff estimate for the demolition we did have a building demolition company give us an estimate of the cost and that's what it, it actually came a little less than that, but we didn't address the septic and other, other site work. So that was, we feel is a, is a reasonable estimate of cost. Uh, the other costs for, for remodeling, uh, we did reach out, the committee did reach out to the Jones Witz architects who did the design for the town hall. And we got an estimate of, I think it was 1.4 million dollars to, to renovate for uh, town for private use and if you had to do it for public use because you'd have to comply with other other standards it would be up to 1.8 million plus uh, so that was kind of a reasonable estimate we did get from our architect it wasn't just a, a wild number uh, something I, I think I'm comfortable with uh, based on what we're seeing in town hall costs and, and other costs in, in, in town. Uh, okay, uh, does anybody else want to make comment on, on the presentation or, or, the, or for the committee that was involved in this before, before we move on to what our next steps are? Yeah, I did have one other question to ask, if that's okay. Is this the right time for me to ask a question? Um, uh, back when um, they were talking about leasing, somehow leasing to someone else would release us from maintenance cost. And I didn't quite get that because I know when I, when you know, back before I owned my home, if I leased a place, I did expect that the owner was going to take care of the maintenance and it seems like that assumption that if you lease to someone that they're going to take care of all the maintenance um, I'm not sure how realistic that is is there some reason why we think that might work in this case when in general I think the owners take care of maintenance the renters just pay the rent so the goal was to imagine it as a as a very long-term lease 
So like a 20 year lease. And in those kinds of leasing situations, often the person sort of acts like they own the building. They do the renovations and they pay the maintenance. Oh, okay. Um, can, I, can I jump in there, Mary? I'm confused about that because I, I can't imagine, even in a 20 year lease, that a, a, a leasee is going to say, um, re redo the roof as roofs are want to be, to be redone. Um, the, the, the capital expenses of an owner leasee relationship, those are oftentimes still falling at the feet of, of the owner, just because a renter is not going to improve the, 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 the capital infrastructure of a building. And maybe I'm wrong, but that's, that's been my experience. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's played out in the lease, right? So the lease defines who's doing what. But no, I think you're right. Sometimes it's more or less depending on the kind of deal and the relationship. Fred, if I may, the other question that I have, and I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anybody that I'm, that I'm asking this. One of the things that I continually want to see is it, it's great that people want to perhaps see a restaurant or a cafe. Um, you know, I've always said, I'd love to have an Irish pub in there um, or maker space or incubator space for startup companies or whatever. But one of the things that we need to know is what's the market demand for these things. I mean, we can want all we want, but if there's nobody that wants to do these things in Waitley because of any number of reasons that, 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 people putting together a business are going to are going to look into when they're deciding on geography and real estate where is that information and how can we get it so that it's a it's so that we're informed in terms of market demand and not just what Waitley residents have as a as a preferred list Jonathan I've I've done some research on that and that was what I would like to propose that we we look at I have some information of course it's several months old uh, I've talked to some uh, one or two realtors uh, and to get an idea of, of the marketing of the of the property. One realtor told me I could uh, run it today if he wanted, uh, and I also got some information on leasing rental costs. So uh, I I think some of that needs to be discussed and, and, and brought out at, at, a, at a future meeting. And I think the, you know, the, the uh, reason maybe for this committee to present something to the, to the town was to, to help the, the select board decide on which way to go here. Uh, yeah, the, the easiest, well, there's really basically three options, demolition, the town ownership or selling the property. Uh, yeah, we've got various uh, uh, options of, of each one of these. And I, I think some of that needs to be discussed further with, with more people in town. I, I guess I'd like to see, see the, uh, a public meeting on, on this project. We haven't had a public meeting on here. We've had a committee together and yes the committee meetings are open open to the public and people are aware of it in uh, scoop and, and newspaper articles but I guess rather than I, I guess I'm not I'm not comfortable as a select board member making a decision today I, I appreciate the information it is useful it provides some direction but I, I think we need to get a public meeting uh, involvement on here to, to hear what other people have and to come up with a vote at a town meeting, whether it's a, probably annual town meeting, to really get an idea of what people in town want to do with this building. It's, we, we, we got information here on the uses, probable uses of it. Judy, I see your hand up. I'll be in a minute. Uh, Thank you. And I guess I would like to share what, what I've found talking to realtors and other people of the, uh, the cost of the building, either as an asset or a liability to the town. And also what does it mean to the town administration to have another, another building to manage? 
I think this should be vetted with, with the residents of the town, get their input and, and come to a public vote. It's, it's a major decision, just like other major decisions we've had in town that I think we need a public meeting. We've done it for the town hall two or three times we had public information meetings. As you well know, the other meetings have been the same way on major projects in town. Uh, that's, that's what I think we should go from here. And yes, Jonathan, you present a very good point of the marketability and what's out there, who's going to buy it, who's interested. Well, we do have some information on that. People are coming to us uh, asking what to do with the building. Uh, when is it going to be available? Uh, and, and there's various various uh, uses being proposed out there. It's not like it's just a vacant building that we have no idea what's going to happen. Well, Fred, the reason for my question, and and I and I, and I don't mean to, to get in front of Judy because I want to hear her, but but Fred, the reason I, for my question is none of that information is in the report. So uh, you know, as someone who hasn't been following the process, I've been counting on the on the committee to to provide all the information necessary to make the decision. I don't see that information that you say that we have in in the report. So that leaves me without that information. So that I just wanted to, you know. Right. It is it is not in the report, Jonathan. Well the, the cost to remodel the building from Jones Winsett, yeah, yeah, is in, in the report. But others information on the marketability and the leasing, no, that is not in the report. I wonder if we could put an addendum to the report with the information well, that you have. Uh, uh, Judy, you have. Yeah, I'd like to mention that one, I don't think anybody on the committee thought that a decision would be made today. Okay. And we definitely didn't provide enough information for you to do that. And to remind you that we did not have a budget and we had limited time. Um, what we did suggest as a way to answer Jonathan's question is that you put out a request for information and find out what proposals might be made from people who would be interested and what they would offer, which would give you the basis for perhaps going forward. We talked about holding a public meeting and decided we didn't have enough information. We have a cost estimate for a very quick cost estimate only for a residential structure. The, the costs will vary depending on the use and we can't we can't work with right. with others for different uses. Um, so we thought perhaps the best way was to get people to come to us. The other thing would be to do a full feasibility study, which as you know is very expensive. Right. Without a budget, we didn't do a market study. Yeah. I'd like to respond to a few of the things that have been said. Um, first of all. There's more information in the report than what we've just presented that here. Right. And it is important to read it. There's more discussion about what it means to tear it down and have a park versus possibly having a park somewhere else. There's information about community, what a community building would be. Because it struck us the fact that we have town hall as a community resource and yet there still was a demand for a community space. Um, so there's more there. Um, second, the, the question of if the town owns it and leases it, what costs do, does the town still hold versus what costs would the leaseor hold? Um, yes, probably a roof would be the responsibility of the town, of the town but if the lessor is assuming the responsibilities of rehabilitating the building, they're also assuming some of the maintenance. So those expenses, some would clearly fall on one side of the line and some would clearly fall on the other side of the line and others would have to be worked out in the lease as somebody else also mentioned. But it, our idea was definitely to create a plan that would take some of the expenses, including the administrative expenses of managing tenants off of the town. So that was part of our idea in proposing a long-term lease. Um, 
you're right, there would probably be some financial liability to the town still, but less than other options. Um, in response to the idea of having a town meeting and the question of, well, what is, we can want what we want, but what will actually get used? We'd like the select board to help get some of that information by putting the project out for proposals. We think that that will answer the, some more of the question of what's viable uses for the building. And it would also provide some information to then take to a town meeting. Our, our recommendation was a unanimous suggestion that we're not ready at this point to endorse the town getting rid of the building because we haven't gotten answers to those questions. And it seems premature to have a town meeting because people are going to ask all the same questions that you're asking here that we asked in our 11 meetings or however many it was. Right. We could discuss that and people need more information to answer those questions. So holding a town meeting without having the material to answer those questions is counterproductive. And, and to, Jenny, certainly to the work we just did. And Jenny, I agree with that 100%. I, you know, it, we, if we're gonna, when we go to town, town meeting eventually, town forum, whatever you wanna call it, we need to look like we're ready for prime time and we've got our big boy pants on and right now we, we wouldn't. Um, <sighs> And so, and I also do like the idea of putting out an RFI uh, because, you know, the, the viability of use is, is really, really important, as everyone knows. Um, you know, any number of ideas could come up, but if no one, can, no one wants to do it, if no one thinks that they can make money in that building, then, then it really is wonderful. It was a wonderful idea, but, but what's the point? So I, I have I would love to see an RFI be put out, uh, RFQ, what, whatever terminology we want to use, and, and it can be written, crafted in a certain way. But I, I definitely think that's the, that's that's the next step. Right, and we and we did note some some concerns about things that need to be crafted, based on experiences people had in the past. Mm -hmm. right. And right. it's not an exhaustive list, I'm sure, but it's a beginning. Right. And, and also remember that the tax base idea is great, but if you, if you, if you decide to, if you do decide to sell, and I'm not saying that's what we should do, but if, if that's the option that's ultimately gone towards, um, if you sell to a nonprofit, there is no tax base. So you got to really think about all these variables. Oh. Uh, may I, Fred? It's 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 Donna Wiley. I, I've been. Okay. Okay. I, I just, I've been raising my hand with the Zoom okay, thing, but I don't know. Um, and sorry, I've got a house full of family and we don't have enough bandwidth, so I can't use my video. Um, I, I just wanted, uh, first of all, to say, I think the committee's done a really good job. And yes, of course the work isn't done yet, but but it's pretty far along. But I, 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 I've been thinking, um, it, over the last couple of years, um, Alan McArdle and I have made a couple of presentations across the state about the town hall project and, and its trajectory. And in the process of that, we've met people from other towns who also have uh, worked on reuse of municipal buildings projects. Um, one of the most interesting stories is from Sunderland. Um, it took Sunderland 12 years to come to agreement about the sale of their town hall to the Blue Heron restaurant. And they, the fellow who gave the presentation was very amusing about the number of votes and disagreements and, you know, backing and forthing. But I um, seriously uh, was impressed by the thoughtfulness and thoroughness of their work with the town. And um, I, I if you're interested, I'd like to, um, and the per sorry, the person who spoke had also served on every committee you could imagine, including the select board during the 12 years. I'd like to unearth, I can go back through my records and see who that was, because I, I think checking in with a couple of other towns, particularly when there's one so close that has dealt with a really complicated problem, um, 
roughly of this sort could be useful. Okay, thank, thank you, Donna. I think the other one comes to mind. I, I don't know if they went through the same thing. It was Smith Academy in Hatfield. How long was that been discussed before anything was ever done there? Uh, the other comment uh, I like to make issuing the, the RFI, RFQ, uh, I, I'm not sh sure what additional information we're going to get from that. The committee is, and using the survey and our meetings have come up with a whole range of possible uses. I, I can't imagine any other kind of use uh, being suggested or suggested that would be acceptable to the town people. And I think we're just delaying the, the process of starting a, another RFQ that I'm not sure what kind of interest you, you, would, you would get for a specific use and then what is that going to tell us that we, if we assume we want to sell the building, we look for, for that kind of use based, based on that? I think there should be more. That kind of use and decision is sell should come from town people. What does the town people think we should make of the use rather than developers from around the country saying, oh, that's a good place for a restaurant. You should advertise for a restaurant. But that wasn't our priority, our highest list highest use on the survey was in a restaurant. Uh, I think it was actually a cafe, but a cafe, but I, but the, I, I thought the idea of the RFI was to identify people who would put money up. And well, why would, so why would somebody want to do that now when I, 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 I don't know, I don't know. You, you've already, you, you already told us you had a realtor who said they could rent it tomorrow. I mean, there's people who are willing to put money up. And what we want to know is, what will they do with the space? That's the question. Well, when they submit a proposal, we will know. And if we get different That's proposals, right. then are it will come up to the, the, the town to decide on which proposal, which use do we want to see at that building not a developer saying it should be a restaurant and advertise for restaurants. Well, then if we're arguing about what's the difference between a request for proposals and a request for information or a request for quotations, I don't care what the last letter is. Right, okay. <laughs> we're gonna get information no matter what. And um, it may be that all the proposals are from commercial interests and that there aren't any that fit the recommendation that the town retain ownership. Or maybe not. We don't know what we'll get. So I, I, it sounds like the RF, fill in the letter, yeah. is about getting more information and the kinds of information that the committee and you agree that we need to, to, to make real concrete decisions. I agree with you that we don't, we don't have the information. I wasn't expecting from the committee all the information needed to make a decision tonight. But I'm very interested in getting more information and what process we might use to get that more information. I, I think frame the document to show them exactly what our parameters are. Uh, you know, we, we, we were, we're, we're open to hearing what people have for ideas with the town owning the building, with, it, with somebody else owning the building, you know, list the parameters mm -hmm. out there and then people can either respond or not respond. Well, that's, that's why I'm saying a, a public meeting to get that kind of input from town people rather than, rather than a, a developer coming in and, and telling us. Uh, but and, but I think the first, the first decision we should make, well, we, we kind of agree we don't want to demolish the building. We want the building to stay there. So <laughs> we can probably go along with that. But the other thing is, does the town want to make, retain ownership of the building or do we want to sell it? And, and that's going to make a difference in, in the, in the, when you advertise for proposals. Well, to, for the town, to, town to, to own the building and, and lease it, I guess we can do that today if that's our decision of the board. We have that authority to do that. We don't need to go to town meeting. If we want to sell the building, then we have to go to town meeting. And, and what information do we, we need to give to people to help us decide or to vote at a town meeting on whether to keep it or sell it? I think Excuse me, but this here. is an, it's an iterative process. We've got to figure out what the town wants to do. We've got to figure out what is doable from the outside. 
right. we can't do one or the other. We've got to do all of it. Yeah, I think that to to add on to that, I think the difference is that we got the town's initial opinions, but likely none of them are going to be the ones who are buying or renting the space. So now we need to flip to the demand side and get a sense of what the demand really is for people who would be paying money for the space and then get a sense of what that side of it is before we meet the two in the middle. Couldn't agree more. Okay. That sounds great. Well said. So next steps, in my book, it's for Brian and whoever he taps to help him um, create an RFI yeah. based on the report. And you know, any other information that we wanna, we wanna place in there. Um, but Brian's the guy who's gotta to put together the RFI with, with, I guess, select board input. So what I'm hearing is maybe the RFI will have two scenarios. One would be, one would be outright sale and one could be um, a town ownership police arrangement and see what's out there. And then based on the RFI, we can, and, and the input from the study, we can craft the RFP to actually um, solicit actionable proposals that we could consider. Right. Yes. Well, the, yes, except that it's not clear that there is a lot of options for how to use the space if it's an outright sale based on zoning issues. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Well, I think the report highlights and notes all the sort of barriers, pros and cons of each of the options, right? And so if somebody wants to, doesn't see those things as barriers and they want to, you know, put something forward that that individual, I mean, it seems like we, we're, we're laying out what we know and we're asking developers to take a look at it and say, can you make this work? Right. Okay, and asking specifically if if they're willing to work with town ownership or are they only willing to proceed with private ownership right right and, and, they will and, tell and show why okay. one alternative let's, let's, is uh, better than another alternative i mean okay. they, they can provide they can provide that quantitative and qualitative analysis of why one alternative would work better than the other, what you know, and show revenue streams and, and, and what have you. Um, but we also should feel very comfortable putting in there that they're going to have to work within historical preservation restrictions and all that kind of stuff. And then they can choose to respond or not. That's up to them. But that's that'll teach us a lot as well. Okay, I want to turn it over to Judy. She's been waiting to. Say no, no, that's. I think my point was covered. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, Rich, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering how much uh, discussion we need to have concerning the uh, actual amount of funds that will be available to some of these other programs, depending on what gets done with that building because of the circumstances with the COVID-19 and the stresses placed on the state, will that money become available if we tried to move in those directions? And does the town have the resources to fill in the gaps? Well, I, I, I don't know, and that's, what you know, some of the information I, I had before was was what it would cost uh, to the town every year if we were to own or, or lease the building. So some of that, I guess, may be useful, but uh, depending on who leases it, how much they want to pay for remodeling. Um, Rich, I think I can tell you that the CPA money is fairly secure. It's in a separate trust fund, and it's the state portion and it's based on real estate fees at the registry and they've been holding up they were just increased and they've been holding up quite well that's good to know um, thank you and judy just so people know and, and we can we can you know have flesh this out further but based upon our commitment to town hall right now how much would be left Max at maximum for his, any continued or any further historic work. Do you know off the top of your head? I just happened to have looked up those numbers. Um, 
the town hall debt is down to 200,000. And we've put aside 43,000 for debt service. That'll probably bring it down by next spring to something like 160,000, 165. We, with interest rates so low, we could certainly borrow again. There's no historic preservation money. There is, or there, I shouldn't say that. The historic preservation bucket is empty. There's $100,000 of unallocated CPA fund money that would be available before the end of the, of the fiscal year. I don't think anybody's gonna spend much before the end of the fiscal year anyway. If we're talking affordable housing, there's 150,000 available. And we're generating about $175,000 a year in new revenue. Some of that has to go to open space, some to, to community housing. But there's, there's substantial money there. And, and, and when is the town hall debt, in theory, complete? So that, so that we're relieved of that? Sounds like about five years. Five years. Less than five, I think. Okay. Depends on interest rates. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, all, it's just all math that we need to think about, that's all. Yeah, yeah no, it's... Okay, does anybody else have anything they wish to comment on right now on this center school? Okay, well, why don't we leave it up to... Uh, Anybody that wants to help Brian, I guess, on the RFI, QP, whatever we call it, to uh, notify him. Don't show up in his office yet. Uh, Without a mask. Him if he wants to help contribute to the development of that. Brian, I'll help. Uh, and then I guess we're going to have to decide on the timing of that. We have to fit that in with our other town priorities to decide whether that's something we're going to do it today or next month or, or whenever. So is that okay, Brian, with you? I'm going to have yeah. to help with that, Brian. Okay. Yeah, there's some good ones we can steal and modify. So I mean, I mean, borrow and modify. <coughs> Plagiarize, right? Yeah, pretty much. But in a good sense. Learn from. <laughs> right. We won't leave a trace that we took it from anybody else. We won't okay, again, thank everybody on the committee that was involved in this in this project for all your help and assistance. And yeah, really, you guys need a round of applause. Thank you for all your hard work and uh, over the years. This is really helpful to get this off the ground. Good. All right. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you again. Moving, moving on with our agenda. Next item is the COVID-19 state of emergency uh, directives that the, the town has. And this, we're going to update one to reflect the, the uh, elections, the, the uh, early election voting at the town offices and all at town office and also open up the town hall for voting on them two days. Hey, Fred, could I jump in? Do you mind? I, I had asked oh. Brian about this, but maybe you didn't get to it. Can I, cause I've got to run. Okay. Can, okay. can we do the, the, the uh, highway department? Oh, okay, sure. Sure, Jonathan, we'll move to, I guess, new business items uh, seven was uh, fill the vacancy for the operator labor at the highway department. Uh, who's, uh, Keith, Keith, do you want to, Say a few words of who the person is and what you're re recommending. Sure, I can I can chime in. Um, Jonathan, Brian, and myself did interviews last week and um, checked some of the references out. And as of uh, let's see, today's Wednesday, so on Monday, offered gave the offered the position to um, one of the applicants, Quincy Ortiz. And as of yesterday, he. I mean, as of today, he responded back to me and said he was accepting the position. So I would, at this point in time, make a recommendation to the select board to go ahead and hire Quincy and begin the process of 
pre-employment physical and everything along that line and to make sure that he passes everything and can be officially hired. Okay, and, and so I, I would I would make a formal motion to uh, appoint hire uh, Quincy Ortiz pending passage of physical and other requirements of the town. I would second that. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, ready for a vote? Joyce? Yes. Jonathan? Yep. Fred, yes. Okay. Go Thanks, everybody. I got to run, and I apologize. But Jonathan, can I have one quick question for you? Uh, on the town use policy, we've got Hurley Field. It's not used for any kind of organized sports or team activity. Is that true? No, it's being used. It's being used by adult baseball right now. So we need to change our use policy on that then. I thought we already had. Uh, well, we'll talk about it with Brian. So we'll look at it some more, but. I thought we already had because we were just abiding by, by the protocol set forth by the governor and 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 approved by the board of health. But right. um, adult yeah. was there, and then keep in mind and and the high school athletic association hasn't come out with anything yet. But to the best of my knowledge, um, the plan for Frontier is still to use Hurley for. Uh, fall soccer until they're told that there will be no fall soccer. So just keep that in mind and that'll start as, as traditionally, you know, the last week in August. Okay. 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 Thanks. All right. Thanks you guys. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Bye. Yeah. So is that covered in our policy, Brian? I didn't see it that specific. And yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember, but we might have voted to. I thought it was no organized sports or teams playing. Um, well, actually, let me let me. We're all set with with uh, the appointment, right? Yeah. Yes, correct. Um, let me bring it up. Well, let me share my screen. That way, everybody can see. So let's look at that one quickly before we get to the other ones. Okay. So at the time we wrote this, it, so this is the this is the second sentence. It, we talked about currently in phase one. Obviously, we're in phase three, step one now. I think um, okay. but the first sentence talks about available for use consistent with guidance from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts reopening plan. Um, it may make sense to just strike that last um, two sentences maybe. I mean, the I think the our intent is that it be open for use consistent with what the state says is allowable. And I think that, I think the Board of Health is okay with that. Um, okay, okay, so you wanna strike the last open part. Yeah, I, I mean, if that's, if that's the board's intent is that it be open for that's, um, that's fine with me if you want to make that change. Yeah, it's sort of one of those things where it doesn't matter. It's sort of a phrase that gives up, for example, yeah. you know, right. um, current to when the document was was uh, um, approved. That's yep. So it, it's sort of a doesn't matter sort of thing. Doesn't matter if it's there, it doesn't matter if it is there. Right. Okay. And the other comment I had is the, the, the top of this page. Brian, I think it says the police department lobby is open. It's not. Oh, I thought it was open. No, the doors are locked. There's a sign outside with a phone number and who to call if you have a need for police. All the time? Or when, yes. just when they're not there? I think that's, all, well, all the time, I would think. I don't, well, if the yeah, they, don't. they answer the door, I, I don't know. I don't know if that outside door is open when they're in there or not. Maybe we uh, should check on that and see what the practice is. Because I thought, I thought what he said last week was that it was um, not open, but the phone numbers were there, so you should call. And then if you call, maybe they'll come let you in. But we should clarify that. We should find out what it really is. Yes, and we should. This. Because I'm not sure why. 
I guess I'm not sure why it wouldn't be um, while they're there. Why? Because I believe yeah. Yeah. I could be remembering it wrong too from the previous yeah. meeting. I'll check. I'll check with Jim. Okay. I mean, I think it's a plexiglass window. So. Right. Yeah. So I'll check. I'll check with Jim on that. Okay. Okay. So going back to our changes for the for the elections, that's what we were. Yeah. Proposed in here with all the dates and times. Yep. So the first proposed change is this is to reflect early voting. And this would be for the town offices for the state primary election and state election. Mm -hmm. And the August dates are obviously for the state, a uh, one week before the state primary. And then the October dates are two weeks before. Uh, the state elections, and I double check these with Lynn. Okay. And then okay. the change for the town hall would be um, the town hall will be open on September 1st. And with the understanding that they may be counting into September 2nd, but I don't, I think that might be okay. Um, I and hope remember, not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not too. So that would allow the town hall to be open then. And then uh, whatever, that's it for the elections and then whatever you, you want to do in terms of the Hurley field, I think either way it would be fine. Okay. Does it matter that I'll need to set up the day before? Oh, do we need to put that in? I, I, that's what I was just wondering. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's not open to the public. It's just right, it's open, not open to the public, so I think that'd be all right because I go in there occasionally Fine. and just check it out. Okay. Okay, so you need a motion from us to accept these? I will make that motion that we um, accept the changes that are um, noted in red. Um, and, oh, and I'm, I'm ambivalent about the others, so I'll just say they, the changes um, in red related to the election and the primary. Okay, I'll second that motion. Okay, uh, roll call vote, Joyce. Aye. Fred, yes. Okay, moving on. Uh, old business, uh, do we wanna discuss priority list? Brian, or you want to defer that? Um, can I just uh, just talk a little bit about uh, something related to COVID before we move on? Okay, good. Okay. And sure. that is, I just wanted to highlight. So the governor is it has issued a revised um, order regulating gatherings, um, and part of that is it, a lot of that is due in part to what they've discovered through contact tracing, is that they believe that a lot of the the spike in cases across the Commonwealth has been related to gatherings, larger gatherings, mm -hmm. informal gatherings, um, where either social distancing and mask wearing wasn't taking place. Um, so what they've done is they've reduced, or the, the governor's order reduces um, the limit on outdoor gatherings from 100 to 50 people, and that's in enclosed outdoor spaces. Um, there was never a limit on unenclosed outdoor spaces um it, it's been a it's been a bone of contention i think with boards of health and the governor in terms of how you decide what's enclosed and what's not oh, enclosed. it was good because i was just going to ask you what like is a tent enclosed i, I was told that if it <clears throat> and maybe lynn remembers some of these conversations i think if it has <clears throat> if it has walls it's enclosed even though if it's outdoors oh roof. okay so um, an open sided tent might still count as unenclosed. But a well, a, I'm not quite sure about that. Yeah. Fran, that's what we had anticipated having for a town meeting, and Fran indicated that that was considered a closed space. So I'm not quite sure because it would hold the virus, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's, but it could have changed by then. So, I mean, that was a discussion many months ago, and it certainly could be a, a different interpretation at this point. 
Okay. <laughs> um, that would be a friend, and I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> there hasn't been very clear guidance. It, it's. I think the clear guidance is that if you're in the middle of an open field, it's unenclosed. Um, <laughs> That's but true. A, an enclosed space could be somebody's fenced in backyard, for instance, could be in enclosed space. Um, and I, I think it's worth, so that's, it went from 100 to 50. Mm -hmm. um, indoor is still, <clears throat> the indoor gatherings um, is still at eight persons per thousand square feet of accessible floor space with a max of 25 people in a single enclosed indoor space. Um, and they've really emphasized that that the order applies to all types of gatherings on both public and private property. Um, so we're talking private homes and backyards, parks, athletic fields, parking lots, those types of things. And I, I think that's an effort. It's an effort to tailor the order to what they think has contributed to the to the spikes. Mm. Um, would adult baseball be uh, something that would break that? If it's 50, if it's unenclosed, the baseball team's going to have 10, 15 people, maybe? It's probably getting close, if not. Yeah, I was thinking today, what about what about sort of youth sports? If you have a baseball mm. team, and it, it, yeah. Um, okay. So... Just want to highlight that um, the order requires face coverings where more than 10 people from different households will be attending, whether indoors or outdoors. Um, and then again, the face coverings are for children two years or uh, children two years old and younger are obviously exempt from the face mask requirement. Um, so, and then they say they're going to throw all these types of, you know, state resources at it, which probably are, we're never going to see, and they're going to really rely on boards of health, um, already overtaxed boards of health and, um, mm -hmm. police departments to try to help with the enforcement of it, which is difficult for them because we don't have a lot of those resources. But I just wanted to highlight that 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 based on the contact tracing that the state has been able to do, that's where they think the mm -hmm. that's where they think the spread is happening from. Um, so I just wanted people to be yeah. be aware of that that and in their own lives. People, yeah, can you help people be uh, aware also of if they are found to do this and with our meager resources? That what is the fine for? not complying with this particular um, order? I believe it's $500, a $500 civil fine. And does that go to the town or does that go to the state? Well, the cynical part of me says the state, but I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I understand that enforcement of various things have been really in the way of um, the police giving warnings and people, and, and it's kind of been an education-based thing. But at some point we stop doing education and start doing enforcement to whatever extent we have resources to do. Yeah. And uh, it's, I mean, unfortunately the, the virus is still around, it's still circulating. It, it's still circulating in our region, it's still circulating in our state. Um, so we just have to keep our guard up so that's all I wanted. I just wanted to mention that, that it, it does really, the order does kind of reach down more into our personal lives than probably the past, the previous ones had. So um, it's just important to okay. note that. Okay, moving on. Uh, priority project list, did you want to, Talk about that, Brian, or want to defer that for next meeting, or? Um, What's your pleasure? Maybe let's at least put it to the end to see. Okay. 
yeah. how far we get. If you can get some started on it, that would be good. Okay, moving on, the next is uh, review draft letter response to speeding and traffic concerns on Chestnut Plain Road. I read, I read through most of that letter and I thought it was um, one of the things I liked about it was that it kind of talked about what we had been already doing, like many of the things that in that bulleted list say, um, you know, continue to do things that we had actually been doing. I liked that as well as um, things that are on our agenda to do, like complete the Chestnut Plain Crosswalk and sidewalk reconstruction because that has some narrowing of the road in it to to help make some, or the crosswalks themselves will help make uh, people slow down. And then the new stuff is also pretty clear. Um, and uh, so I think I think you guys did a great job in the letter. And I'd be happy to sign it if we need more than one signature. Okay. okay. Well. Who did the did the letter the request go to the select board or did it go to the town administrator? I think it was sent to the select board. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to sign it as well if you. Okay. Put it on the table. All right. Okay, oh, Keith, did you have any comment on it? I don't know if you've seen all of this before or. Anything you wanted to say? Good, bad, and different? I just scanned the letter as Brian was scrolling down. Um, one thing that I did is I've already contacted um, MassDOT in regards to seeing if I could meet with them to look at the triangle intersection a little bit. Um, I have not heard back from them yet, um, but I did that last week, so. Um, I, you know, I'm, I I contacted contacted one of the traffic engineers in Mass DOT Northampton. So we'll see. That I mean, I think the letter is a good response. Yeah. And um, Brian, didn't we just get some more information this afternoon? I haven't had a chance to read that from the Lord Urcog. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at it either. Um, but she, she did what she said she was going to do in terms of, um, breaking down some of the, uh, the speed data into vehicle classifications. And I, I believe she also has, um, uh, data from, uh, speed data from 2016, right. From, from South Chestnut Plain, uh, I think it said from the Southern portion of Chestnut Plain Road. So I'll, I'll share that. Okay, and we, we talk about increased traffic monitoring efforts by the police. Do we know what they're what they're doing, Brian? Have you seen anything? Or, I mean, we, we talked about it at our last meeting, and I have like seen them um, parked on Chestnut Plain Road quite regularly lately. Yeah, and I received an email from one of the residents thanking us for the increased traffic uh, traffic uh, monitoring presence. Okay, so... I think the challenge will be to sustain that over a longer period of time to, so we can change behaviors. Okay. As far as, as, far as trucks going through, is, is there... Maybe Keith knows... Well, I went through there about a week ago, and it seems a lot of tire tracks are on the Waitley End, like construction, like asphalt paving equipment, or trucks going towards Williamsburg. Is there projects out there where they're using that intersection? There's, a, you know, every so often there's a paving job somewhere in another town where trucks are driving through. Yes. Okay. But nothing, uh, 
long term, I guess, or whatever. Okay. No, it's just a, a day here and there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so prepare the letter and we'll sign it here in the next day or two. Okay. Uh, Next item, a new business, discuss the shared streets and spaces grant program. Yeah. Brian, I guess you made some proposals and I, I guess I made some proposals as well. And I guess we need to uh, decide which ones we're gonna move forward with. Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, bring it up here. And I guess maybe the, the three of us should meet or discuss it before we present it to the board. Um, yeah, let me talk a little bit about the about the, what the grant program is. Okay. Um, So this is a, it's a grant program through MassDOT. Um, they're really trying to. It's not up on the screen. Is that, are you intending that is, there's something on the screen? Because I still um, see a Chestnut Plain Road letter. It still is. Um, thank you for letting me know. <laughs> I'm sure. Can you see that? Yeah. Looks like an email. Looks like an email. Yeah. All right. Um, so this program from MassDOT that's looking for, um, they used to be called shovel ready projects when we had air funds available, but quick turnaround projects, um, kind of related to the complete streets projects, the, com the complete streets program. They're looking at, at, um, quick projects that would um, increase pedestrian safety, bicycle safety. Um, but the, the, the catch is that they wanted to um, help um, local establishments, whether it's promoting outdoor dining. So converting um, examples would be co converting sidewalks into um, outdoor dining space. Um, trying to um, provide maybe bigger sidewalks or dedicated bike lanes where people can kind of spread out and exercise. Um, there's also com there's also a component about um, focusing on on safe routes to schools. So with the expectation that more kids might be walking to school and not taking the bus. Um, how can they, how can kids walk to school more safely? So there's, that's one of the objectives. Um, it, there's $5 million available. They've, so it's a, it's on a rolling deadline. There's, I just checked the other, uh, this afternoon, there's 3.8 million awarded. So there's 1.2 million left. Um, uh, I went back and looked at all the awards that they've, that they, um, awarded in July and August. And a lot of them, a lot of them have to do with sidewalks and other infrastructure improvements related to outdoor dining or pedestrian and, and bicycling activity. Um, so we're trying to figure out how Waitley could take advantage of it. And I had originally emailed Keith some ideas and some, um, some are a little bit more pie in the sky and probably can't be done on, with, or with this grant resource, but um, I suggested looking into extending the sidewalks from the center cemetery um, over the, the bridge and connecting up with Quan Quan. Um, I think there's, there's been discussions about trying to connect Quan Quan with uh, the, other, um, yeah. the other assets in town. Whatever happens with the center school, the library, the way we end, the, the town hall, trying to connect those areas. Um, We're going to be looking at um, repaving the library parking lot. So I wasn't—we weren't sure if there, if we could 
sneak those costs into there and also do more improvements um, maybe in the back in terms of making a place where people could get outside and um, just have an outdoor space and get outside and something like that. It, and it was interesting to hear that or see those survey results where they talk about there, there wants to be a community space in the center of town. Um, and I was thinking about it and there's the town hall, but the town hall doesn't really, there's not a lot of outdoor community space in the center of town, I guess, so to speak. There's, there's the, there's the sidewalks that obviously in the wide, wide right of way, which is kind of like a park, except for the vehicles that are going through, but there's not a lot of outdoor community space in the center mm -hmm. of town. Um, and Judy had suggested, well, maybe behind the library is a, is a good spot to do that because of the nice views. And I think the town owns, owns about six acres back there. Mm. Um, three, I suggested extension of the sidewalks at the Whitley Elementary School to Long Plain Road. That's off the complete streets plan. The sidewalk ends um, well before the, you know, well before the street. So many kids who are walking or cycling are coming on coming down the driveway yeah. um and then also at i think this is also from the complete streets plan well partially it was hurley park um looking at paving the parking lot this also came up when we did the ada um, um i don't remember what it was called accessibility analysis ada study mm -hmm. um that um Hurley wasn't exactly handicap accessible in terms of the restrooms and the concession, which happened to be in the same the same building. Uh, we look at paving sidewalks to the bathrooms. And while I think it, Keith and I were talking, it, it probably we probably have some legal impediments to doing this in terms of we don't own all the property that we would need to do this. We talked about putting the crosswalk and sidewalks over to from Hurley Park to Five J's. Um, to try to uh, make that a little bit safer. Um, and then I was also cognizant that we're dedicating a lot of resources to the um, to the Chestnut Plain Road and that area of town. So I was trying to think if there was anything in East Waitley or West Waitley that, that might make sense to try to focus these funds. Uh, I don't know that it would get all the way to West Waitley, but um, since it looks like we're going to be having a recreation area kind of south of the center of town off Chestnut Plain Road, where we're going to make that little parking area, the um, only other thing I can think of is extending sidewalks to there. Now that's a long way, and I know it's sort of on the complete streets to extend sidewalks down to the church and then in you know, various steps. Um, but um, that, I mean, because the Waitley Woods is not yet uh, uh, completely done, I know we've done what we can do to move it along and it's kind of not in our hands anymore. But that might be something to consider. I don't know if it's on the right time frame for this stuff. It's not probably shovel ready. So that's the only other thing I can think of off the top of my head here. Yeah, I mean, we we are queuing up with, with Taylor Davis to do the other sidewalk, so. Mm. Um, Possibly it could it could yeah. could fit. I know I don't know what the resident feedback has been from that because I don't think there's existing sidewalks there now. Right. Um, right. And yeah, that, like, that would take a lot more, you know, planning and engineering and so on. I do like the idea of getting Quan Quan. Well, I'll say closer to town, even though it's really just a matter of closer by walking or closer by biking. Um, to make it a, a more walkable place. But that's not really West Waitley either. Sure. Hurley, though, is East Waitley. Yeah. Um, and these were, so So Fred had emailed back and he had some ideas and we paved the sidewalk at Dwayley Elementary School that goes through the grass area to the circular driveway where people park. Um, Construct and pave a sidewalk from the conference room door to the driveway at the town office building. Construct a walkway and exit door for the large future office space at the town building. Um, tree trimming along Chestnut Plain Road and then 
identify the location and sign for a temporary bus stop at Christian Lane and State Road, um, or possibly a bus stop at Muffins. Another another aspect of the of the of the shared streets and spaces program is that they're looking to um, they're looking to promote in advance. Uh, I think they actually talk about busing. So so bus stops and things like that would be an eligible expense. I think the, the, the bus stop at Christian Lane and State Road was part of the complete streets. Eventually, if you put sidewalks on Christian Lane, that there would be a, a stop there. I think that was in there somewhere. I think you're right. Yeah, I think that was too. No. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'm just suggesting uh, yeah. maybe a, a temporary one to see how it works, how much people, how much use you get before you do anything permanent. So I also, when Jonathan talked to me this afternoon and said he, he wasn't going to be around for this discussion, he wanted to, he wanted me to be his proxy and say that he would like, he would like to focus on, um, the old state road area. So kind of behind the trickle of shops and cross 116 towards Tritown Beach. Um, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure if this program would necessarily be, be the right fit for that. Um, but that's another area that could, I guess could have some pedestrian scale improvements eventually. I don't know if the timing would necessarily work, but it depends on what happens with some of those properties back mm. there. I can't even imagine what to do to make the, that more pedestrian friendly. It's a very car sort of place. Yeah, you've got the intersection yep. with 116 there is uh, very dangerous, whatever you're gonna do there for pedestrians. Yeah, I'm not sure his intent was to get people across 116, but sort of that pocket of land behind the struggle of shops mm -hmm. between the struggle of shops and um, um, the train tracks. And I don't think all of that is in Waitley either. The far end. I think that, yeah, I think he's talking oh, about the part a, that is in Waitley though. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I, I would need something more specific about what, what would you want to do there? Yeah. Um, you right. think something that would help promote those shops being used for something other than, you know, empty store lots. You know, <laughs> I mean, but I'm not saying that nothing could be done. I just I don't understand what um, what we could do in terms of infrastructure to make that right. better. Because I don't have a good imagination, apparently. Uh, in in terms of the quick turnaround for this grant, I it's probably yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a real estate technical assistance grant that we apply for every year and we never get mm -hmm. um, that could help us with some, some, maybe some, uh, a discrete master plan or some type of visioning for that, for that area. But this one really, we really need to turn this around pretty quick. Okay. Well, it sounds like the sky, sidewalk to this school sounds like it's going to be a, a really good fit for this. That should be, I don't know how many things we get to put on there. But that seems like one of um, sidewalks at several, several locations. Yeah, depending on which list, the one that Fred wrote, I think it's number one on his list, but it was not a different number on Brian's list. Yeah, that seems like a good match. Do you know how much it would cost to run the sidewalk on Long Plain Road from Christian, Christian Lane? Lane to the school? Yeah. No, I don't, and because that's another, you know, once you get into anywhere you're dealing with the environmental stuff and having to do a notice of intent. So getting across the stream and widening that area and raising, you know, changing a lot. I just don't see that as a, as something that would fit this program where we're going to be able to get a quick return quick. And there could be right away issues possibly. Possibility. Yeah. That would have to be determined. Correct. That would and you know, it's the same thing with, as I mentioned to you before, going towards Quan Quan, you, you know, that project would definitely involve um, conservation and permitting with DEP to, to do any widening through there. So 
right? So we probably need to stick to somewhere where we own. For sure own. All right. Hmm. I guess based on the, the short uh, timing of, of, of uh, getting the projects implemented, I, I think that we should focus on the sidewalks Mm -hmm. uh, several locations and 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 uh, I maybe rely on Taylor Davis give us an estimate of what it would be or I, I don't unless Keith thinks that he wants to do it with uh, with asphalt paving I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know I mean I, I think we could take the the real numbers we have are you know the bid numbers the, the yep. prices on a linear foot numbers that we have for the current contract in the center of town and just apply those to yeah, the right. yeah. distances and you have your estimate already without yeah. doing anything. Yeah. And that's going to be asphalt in town? If Yes. Uh, so we could use those same numbers to come up with a cost for an asphalt. Okay. The elementary school, maybe that one there, you might want to do concrete because it is, everything there is concrete for the sidewalks already. So. Um, but we do have uh, a, some of the work at the town hall is going to be done in concrete. So I, I don't see a problem in getting a, a decent estimate right very easily for per the linear foot for concrete and being able to prepare an estimate real quick and easy. Uh, you know, thinking about it at the, at the school, if you put concrete, it may be more difficult for plowing snow, whether it's if you had asphalt, it would be easier to clear the asphalt. It wouldn't be so much a grade differential. With concrete, you're going to have a curb and gutter curb there probably or something, but this is, a, I don't know. Is it, I'm trying to think how we can get projects funded that we want to have to do anyways. Is there space to add a bike lane to the school driveway? Um, yeah, the, the area that people park along all the way in, uh, as you drive in on the right-hand side, is like a gravel shoulder Yeah, that people park during events. That, that when the road gets widened, I mean, gets paved, it could be widened with asphalt. And then a sidewalk in addition to that? Maybe then you're getting closer to the to the fence line along the ball field. Right. Could, you, could we do both sidewalks and a bike lane there? Possibility. I mean, what's the what's the possibility of just trying to even put the entire paving of the school parking lot in and incorporating a bike lane and everything all at once? Mm. I, I think that's how we would have to sell it. We already have the estimate for the for the paving. We could add just a little bit more for to encompass a bike lane in and a sidewalk in. Could, could we add the sidewalks that were discussed to, to go from the building to the playground for handicapped? Yeah, it could be. We talked or paving that area, whether you call it sidewalk or paving, whatever, but yeah. So I'm 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 getting the sense that we should focus on the school. Then I think that's that exactly. we look at. It might be the easiest one. Yeah, unless a bus stop, you think might be also a, a good candidate and a match to the description, which I don't remember. I don't know where the description is anymore. But the, the bus stop could be a real inexpensive thing. Right, really expensive, and we could may rely on FERCOG and, and FRTA to. Yeah, I guess to me, part of the part of the conflict is the bus stop makes more sense when you've got sidewalks so that people can walk to the bus stop. As is without sidewalks, then you're really more of a park and ride, and the only parking there is contingent on castways being closed. Right. Um, so 
Um, that's my, my, my only hesitation there. Uh, if it's really going to be a park and ride, the better location is probably Muffins. Right. And then maybe you would have an incentive for increased business at Muffins if they had a park and ride there. Yeah. And, and they, we would need their cooperation on allowing people to park. Right. Who are taking the bus in. Right. So I, that sounds like a bit more work, though. It sounds like for the school-related things, we might be able to pull together something much more quickly. Um, so I, I, I would, I could argue either way on this, and maybe the people who have to put the proposal together <laughs> can can pipe in as to um, if if either of these bus stop scenarios are really realistic. Well, if you go to the bus stop, I I think. The FERCOG and the transit agency got to be a major player in that. I mean, they know the route, they know where it's safe to stop and all that. Uh, we're just, I guess, supporting them uh, more than anything. Yeah, and, and supporting public transportation, which I think is important. Right. That we at very least maintain the access we have to public transportation um, in this day and age. So can we can we do this like two projects? One with sidewalks around the school, and the other with the uh, park and ride lot, and get go and I guess submit the park and ride directly to FERCOG for their support. Are you talking about submitting a grant for both, or just pursuing both? projects. Oh, is there a limit on how many we can um, ask for in a grant proposal? Or you just yeah. submit multiple proposals? Um, I have to double check. I, I mean, it's capped at 300,000. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll get close to that. There's there's 3.8 has been 3.8 million has been awarded already. So there's 1.2 left. Most of what's been awarded it has to do with sidewalks and infrastructure and mm. maybe it's safer to go things. with the school project. It's sort of a for us. It's a bigger uh, potentially a bigger um, offset of expenses that we want to go through with in the future anyway. And um, yeah, that sounds like a lot more work for a lot less money. Yeah. In Fred, I, Fred, I'm also wondering if, if if you recall if there's money in the um, from the TPO meetings we were going to, yeah. whether there'd be money for a bus stop and things like that. I, I don't remember. And I, I haven't paid that close attention to the, the transit agency portion of that. Yeah. That might be another, that might be another source. You know, bring that up at the, in a future meeting. Right? Yeah. The only thing with that, okay. if you put all the the uh, paving of the school parking lot, I don't know what what do we what was the estimate cost estimate key? I don't remember what it was. It was presented by to the capital planning committee this year. I don't remember what it was. Was it around eighty thousand? I don't remember. I can't remember. Okay. But I'm thinking if you well, you get that, you're going to add some sidewalks. I don't know if they're looking for lower cost projects to spread the money around more places, where well, that's going to be a deterrent to us getting considered. You know, because some of these, well, you've seen the list, Brian, are, are small dollar-wise projects. I don't know, unless you can can separate the the sidewalk portion of the paving out and say that's say twenty thousand dollars to do all the sidewalks and the and the rest of the driveways parking lot is what sixty thousand or whatever whether you'd have a better chance that they would fund sidewalks and not the whole thing. I don't know. It would be scaring scare them away if you say you want eighty thousand. I don't know. 
yeah, we can try to get a sense of maybe there's some there's someone at Mass DOT we can talk to about what they favor. Yeah. About what they're really looking for. Yeah, can we get a maybe a sense on Brian, you already said they've awarded a certain amount. Can we look to see what projects they've awarded and then we can get a gauge as to the dollar amounts? I didn't see hardly any over seventy thousand. Some as low as nine, nine thousand. Yeah. So maybe keep it simple. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd say our chances are better to keep the cost down. Okay. Um, so it's rolling. It's rolling admission. It's a uh, rolling admission. What is this college? Um, rolling application deadline. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if we want to take this up on August 26th or you want me, Fred, and Keith. Does the board want me, Fred, and Keith to pull something I think, together? I think pull something together and. Um... We've, I think we've kind of got the general outline, right? That uh, uh, keeping it simple and um, get, getting something so we can get in there before all the money's gone and uh, get something that is uh, in the price range that's more likely to get funded. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll right. work on that and do it, we'll try to do it before our next meeting so we can get in early. Okay. Yep. Uh, next item, review and sign the state primary election warrant for September 1. Okay, we have to come in and sign that. Okay, we can do yeah, a motion at this meeting or? Yeah, I think, you would, I think you'd want a motion. We need a motion, okay. It's on here twice. <laughs> well, uh, I would make a motion uh, that we sign the primary election warrant for September 1st, 2020. Okay, I'll second that motion. Roll we'll call vote, Joyce? Aye. Fred, yes. Okay, moving on to review and approve census final boundary validation form. So this would be, the motion would be to authorize Fred to, mm. to sign the form that Lynn has reviewed and said is no different than any other year because town boundaries haven't changed very much. Okay. Right. Do we have an earthquake that moves some boundaries somewhere or even a little bit? When you oh, say town so boundary far, Sorry, go ahead. So far, so good. No, no changes to the boundaries. Okay. So essentially, it's no changes. Okay. Not even a little bit. I, okay. I did have one question, though. Who owns the riverbed? Wait, I don't know, Sunderland. on the boundary map, it says we own half of the river and Sunderland owns the other half. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right, that's what I was wondering. Okay. Well, I move that we authorize Fred to sign the census final boundary validation form. Okay, second. Those in favor, roll call vote, Joyce. Aye. Fred, yes. Okay. Non administrator updates. Brian? Um, so we sent out the um, notice to proceed to Taylor Davis today um, for the Chestnut Plain road work, crosswalks, and sidewalk reconstruction. Um, Keith said that um, Williamsburg Road Bridge, the contractor, was he there today or he's going to be there today? Um, now he's unmuted. No, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, the, he was there. They have, they have moved their equipment in. Um, so that'd be ongoing. Are you expecting the, the road to be open this year yet? Yes. At this point in time, I'm still keeping my fingers crossed, you know, that 
it will be completed by around Thanksgiving. Okay, that'd be good. Um, so the planning board's been meeting and talking about a um, certain property on State Road that is a home occupation trucking business um, or the, what appears to be a home occupation trucking business. Um, and this has spurred on, a, um, I think, a larger discussion in the planning board about looking at different how different areas of town are zoned. Um, so I just wanted to let the board know that I think they're going to be having that discussion at their next meeting um, in terms of whether to recommend any, any, in terms of whether to begin the process of looking at different areas in town and how it's zoned. So I think they're going to meet on the 25th. Um, if you guys are interested in that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that area they're talking about is zone commercial. I think I it's know, residents all around, but that portion of state road close to the 91 interchange, I think is zone commercial. I think, I think north of the, the 91 overpass is is residential that's where it starts residential i thought it was north of the barn that barn to the there. south of it south well okay to the south of the overpass um in terms of the water merger project um myself nicholas and wayne will be meeting with somebody from mass rural water association well meeting through zoom mm -hmm. um and they're going to try to um get us in touch hopefully with some water utility consultants that have done this in some capacity um, in terms of small water districts getting merged into towns to try to help us move this forward. Um, and that'll be tomorrow morning. Um, there's a lot more grant opportunities that are coming out. Um, feels like over the past week, one is, I think we talked about the meta grant the um, Municipal Energy Technical Assistance Grant um, that opens on the 20th, and we're going to look at um, filling in the gaps from the UMass study at the elementary school. Um, the Maya uh, Safety Grant has also come out, or the, the Risk Mitigation Grant, I think is what they call it now. So we'll be looking at that. And then there's also a real estate technical assistance grant that Mass Development puts out. Um, last year we applied for assistance with uh, the DeMille property in the center school and they didn't award that. Um, one of the things that I mentioned to, to Jonathan was that I, I think his idea about sort of an area plan for um, around the 116, five and 10 intersection there it's probably more appropriate if we're gonna take a, a wider view of, of that area. Um, so that's a possibility. I'll, I'll talk to him more about that. Um, and each year there's a, there's a source to see cleanup. Those are the folks that go down to Hurley and the goalie there and pull out all sorts of trash. Um, they're proposing to do that again, socially distanced, um, safe way to do it. Um, and I was assuming that, assuming that the Board of Health is okay with that, is, is the board okay with allowing them to do that? And assuming we want to haul their trash again, Keith? Um, wait, they don't haul away the trash, they just pull it out and yep. leave it someplace for us to pick up? Well, they, they ask us if, if we will volunteer our time to take the trash that's left in the Hurley Heat parking lot and dispose of it. And in the past, we've always done that. Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't say volunteer our time. I mean, the employees are getting well. Paid employees are to getting do it paid. during their yeah. volunteer their the hours. town's resources. Yeah, yeah, but it seems like a good cause. It's it's not a big deal. I mean, we just go down and pick up. In most cases, what we end up picking up are, is metal, so it just gets recycled. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have no objection to that. Yeah, I have no problem with that either. Do we need a motion? Um, 
Sure. See, whenever I ask, you say that. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I move that we uh, support the source to see cleanup as we have done in past years <coughs> with allowing access and uh, taking care of the trash using town resources. Second the motion. Roll call vote, Joyce. Aye. Fred, yes. <coughs> okay. I, I think I had um, forwarded this email when it came out, but the state has committed to funding unrestricted general government aid and chapter 78 at levels equal to fiscal year 20. Um, so those are the, those are the two big ones that we were watching because that's a significant portion of the local aid that we receive. So we um, had estimated or used for our town budget uh, projections that we would get some cuts to both of those, right? Yeah, especially unrestricted general, general government aid because that's what they did during the Great Recession. Um, no. So which, they, yeah, but, and I guess the follow-up is how solid do you think this promise is? Because, you know, things can change. Yeah, it's not set in stone until the budget's passed. Mm. Um, okay. The, gov the governor has the ability to do what are called 9C cuts to, a, to the budget, mm -hmm. but 9C cuts can't cut local aid. Um, 9C cuts can, the, gov <coughs> the governor can cut um, budgets that the state controls or that the governor controls. Mm. with nine seat cuts. Um, it still doesn't give me a great feeling about um, fiscal year 22 because it feels like at, at some point, I don't know if this is the right expression, but at some point the pain's going to come. Yeah. And we may be kicking the can down the road. I, it's, it, I think it's just too early to tell. Mm. Um, but the first thing is they, they really need to pass a budget yeah. to lock those numbers in. And I know there was talk of if our, um, that's, you know, if the money from the state actually shows up that we didn't expect, that we might go look at some capital projects and, and other things later on. And it, I guess sounds like that will depend a lot on when do they pass the budget because then there'll be a narrow window between that and when we have to set our tax rate. Is yeah. That so does it really seem conceivable that we'll have time to consider any other you know, capital items that we deferred, you know, important things that we deferred just because of the, the financial uh, cuts we were expecting? I mean, is there, is there a problem with that plan, I guess? <laughs> um, I don't think so. It'll, I mean, we, we have to set the tax rate we have to set at the absolute latest by the end of December, um, mm -hmm. but that doesn't give any time to get tax bills out. So really we're looking to set it, um, mm -hmm. you know, late November, early December at the latest. And I'm uh, guessing that's when we're going to have a state budget. It, it, it very well could be. I heard they wanted to see what the tax collections were for July, which they should know by now. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I haven't heard. Um, that's a good question. For I'll, I'll email Natalie and see if she has any projections as to when they may right. when they may consider that. Yeah, I'm not necessarily saying we should spend all that, but we should at least go back and reconsider some of the projects that we put off solely because we were anticipating um, less money in those um, uh, from those sources. Right. Okay, yep. what else you have, Brian? Um, I think that's it for town administrator updates. Okay. Well, I would move to adjourn. Okay, second that. Okay, roll call vote to adjourn. Joyce? Aye. Brad, yes. Okay, enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night, Kevin.